Hello, and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is John Viglotti, and on behalf of OTC Markets, as well as our co-hosts, Murdoch Capital Partners and TAA Advisory, we're very pleased you joined us for today's presentations. Kicking off our afternoon Vanadium Company presentations is our keynote titled, The Outlook for Vanadium, Supply, Demand, Projections, and Analysis. And before I introduce our keynote speaker, please note to submit your questions in the question box to the left of the slides. And all of today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24-7 replay. At this point, I'm very pleased to welcome Terry Perlis. He is the Secretary of the Board of Directors of U.S. Vanadium. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, John. And uh, welcome everybody in the audience. I looked at the agenda for today and really looks like we've got a great uh, number of speakers here following me. So I encourage everyone to uh, hang on and, uh, and listen to uh, some, some good presentations from my colleagues in the Vanadium space. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, market fundamentals, take a backward look at supply and demand and prices, and uh, try and set the stage for what is uh, coming down the road for us here in the vanadium market. Um, this slide is uh, just a snapshot looking back in time at supply, demand, and uh, the vanadium price. And some of the things we see here, of course, are these important price spikes uh, every so often, which uh, shoulder to shoulder are typically not very long, but they're quite painful. Um, we can see some correlation here on this chart uh, between periods where production uh, was below consumption for several years uh, preceding these price spikes. Um, we can look at this data a little bit differently here if we just look at change in inventory on an annual basis. And here again, you see uh, this correlation uh, several years in the early 2000s of building inventory um, and uh, pushing the price down. And then after uh, a few years of depleting that inventory, we hit a wall and the vanadium price eventually responds again. So uh, looking back in time, um, we have a market that is very unstable in terms of uh, historical pricing. And that's all a result of the supply demand balance. Now looking forward, there's a lot of questions to what, uh, what we're gonna see next in the vanadium world. And um, I'm put this chart up here to try and look at the change in vanadium consumption really from 2002 to 2030. And what this chart is showing us is that the majority of the growth in vanadium consumption over this period has been driven by growing global steel production, the number of tons of steel being produced every year. And we know we've seen that, uh, that number moving up dramatically through the 2000s and uh, up until the last year or so. And that's provided the majority of the growth in vanadium consumption. There's also a, uh, another important variable that impacts vanadium consumption, and that is the specific vanadium consumption rate, or how many kilos of V are consumed in the steel industry for every ton of steel produced. It's important to understand that today, uh, if we look at uh, steel production uh, in total, uh, only about 20% of the steel being produced today is microalloyed steel uh, utilizing vanadium or niobium or titanium or some combination of those elements uh, to very efficiently increase the yield strength of the steel. And what we see is every year this percentage of the total steel that's produced being microalloyed steel is growing. And there's just a, a very strong economic argument for that uh, that growth, we can see, uh, for example, in China, as uh, over the last 25 years, China's worked to uh, increase the economic opportunity for people in the country. Uh, in order to do that, uh, they need to industrialize the economy. And of course, infrastructure is the backbone of, uh, of uh, a industrialized economy. And steel, of course, is very critical in that process. And Chinese, uh, Leaders in the industry learned very early that they could uh, utilize the microalloying technique of adding very small amounts of vanadium, typically 0.05% V to a ton of steel, to have a dramatic impact on the yield strength. And the result is that uh, they have been able to very efficiently 
build out the infrastructure to support economic development. Uh, by utilizing high strength, low alloy steels, we can accomplish this goal with a minimal consumption of raw materials, minimal consumption of energy, uh, minimal pollution generation, and a minimal amount of capital deployed in steel making capacity to achieve the job. So looking forward, we expect to continue to see that specific consumption rate growing and uh, contributing to growing uh, vanadium consumption. The one thing everyone's focused on today, of course, is batteries and energy storage. And uh, uh, more specifically, vanadium redox flow batteries. This is a technology that is uh, suitable for grid level applications. We're not gonna see these batteries on cars, uh, but they are uh, very, very uh, efficient in terms of their ability to store energy at the grid level and to um, peak shave and to uh, allow for more and more uh, renewable energy, wind and solar that is intermittent uh, to be utilized and not truncated. For example, in Southern California in the summer today, uh, we have a huge amount of solar power production. Uh, on the solar uh, grid, uh, we need to produce and consume electricity uh, simultaneously at the same rate. And that means when the solar production in the middle of the day starts peaking, there's nowhere for that power to go. And uh, the power production ends up being truncated because of a lack of ability to store that energy. And that's the ex perfect uh, type of application for these batteries. They have extremely long life. There's absolutely no fade in performance over time that you would see with other technologies. There's no concerns about fire. And if we look at the fact that the electrolyte uh, is never consumed in this uh, in this battery. The battery can run for 20 years and we can take the electrolyte, which represents uh, some people will say half of the capital cost of the system and take it to the next battery. And so in essence, we can cycle this uh, vanadium electrolyte over a infinite number of cycles. And in that regard, actually the cost of the vanadium in that system starts to approach zero. So as we go forward, we're gonna see a, a massive growth in grid level storage. And of course, there'll be many technologies, uh, including vanadium redox flow battery that take, uh, take a part of that market. This data we're looking at here is a part of a uh, study that was put together by Guidehouse Insights uh, just about a year ago. And uh, it's, I think it's a, a dangerous and, and difficult job to try and forecast market share in a, a new market, new technologies, and dozens of competing technologies. But if we look at the guidehouse numbers here, um, we can see that they're projecting significant uh, uh, growth in megawatt hours of vanadium flow batteries. We can convert that into vanadium consumption. In a redox flow battery, uh, we require about 4.5 to 5.5 metric tons of pure vanadium for every megawatt hour of storage capacity. And uh, the number will vary between those that low and high level, uh, depending on the efficiency of the cells and, and a number of other operational uh, factors. But if we make the assumption here, five uh, metric tons per megawatt hour, we can see that this forecast translates into 164,000 metric tons of V consumed in batteries in 2031. And just uh, for scale, going back uh, to the first slide, uh, the market in 2022 was uh, just about 115,000 metric tons of V. So what this forecast is projecting is that uh, vanadium redox flow batteries are going to grow to the point that uh, we're gonna have to see about 150% growth in vanadium production over the next seven or eight years to meet this uh, forecast demand. One of the things that uh, people are focused on with these batteries, again, is the cost and typically uh, focused on the capital cost. And it is, uh, I believe, true that a lithium ion battery capital cost is going to be lower than the vanadium redox flow battery capital cost. Uh, but if we step back and look uh, at CapEx and OpEx, and again, understanding there's a very large credit uh, or value retained in the vanadium in this system at the end of its life, uh, we, see, we see that uh, these batteries are in fact 
cost competitive uh, in today's market. So we're going to see growth in demand for vanadium in these batteries. The question is how much? And again, I think that's a difficult question to answer. And in my view, uh, the guidehouse forecast kind of sets an upper boundary on what uh, could happen in terms of vanadium consumption in these batteries. So let's uh, turn now and look at the supply and demand uh, picture going forward. In this slide, we show the, uh, the bars uh, are the consumption in various geographic regions. And this data mirrors the earlier slide we saw, primarily the growth uh, in those bars, excluding the energy storage segment of the bar is uh, gonna come in the future from growing specific uh, vanadium consumption rates rather than growing steel production. But what you can see here is that if we make the assumption that the existing capacity that's out there uh, operates at full capacity and all of the producers that are in the game today follow through on planned capacity expansions, that gets our supply base up to this green line or about 174,000 metric tons of V in 2030. And obviously that's well short of the total demand of more than 300,000 metric tons of V uh, that we would see if the guidehouse forecast comes true. Um, so the message here is clearly there's need for new production to supply this market. And of course, we talk about new production, we've got uh, to think about raising capital and we've got to think about OPEX and cash costs. Uh, I'll throw this slide out just uh, for the sake of information to show uh, what, what I believe the uh, cash cost curve in the vanadium space looks like right now. And you can see out at the far right of this graph, uh, the last couple of dots uh, uh, have a uh, incremental cash cost of somewhere around 12 to $13 per pound of V2O5. And I think that uh, that becomes an important number. Um, let's go on now and have a look at some historical pricing data. Uh, this is the nominal price. So these numbers have not been inflated. If we, I go back to January of 2004, which was really the beginning of the modern era of vanadium uh, use in the steel industry. This is really when China began producing high strength, low alloy rebar and the market uh, changed uh, significantly. So we look at monthly average published prices, in this case, as published by Metal Bulletin Magazine. And again, you see this, uh, this pattern of uh, uh, intermittent price spikes um, I think it's uh, important to look at the mean and the median data here, 806 and 675. Those numbers tell us something, I think, about the uh, cost of production historically. We can take that data and look at it a little bit differently, looking at uh, a frequency distribution chart here. And again, what we see here is that the most predominant price is between six and seven dollars. So you know, that historically has been the sweet spot of the market. But if we take a look at this data uh, on an inflated basis, given what's happened the last couple of uh, years uh, with uh, inflation in metals prices, we start to see some very different statistics. So this is that same time period. Uh, this is the real price. So it's been inflated based on a, uh, a uh, inflationary factor. And you know, what you can see here is the dramatic change in the mean and the median. And, you know, this data would suggest that the, the mean price over the last uh, 20 years is about $12.46. So I think depending on your perspective of, of what's going to happen from an inflationary standpoint, uh, that, that's going to have some impact on what your forecast for vanadium prices uh, will be going forward. Again, we look at that same data here in a price distribution format, and uh, we see that the most predominant price uh, is still that seven to eight dollar range, but uh, really from seven to twelve dollars uh, uh, are quite uh, quite frequently seen. So I think that's uh, some important data to keep in mind as you're thinking about uh, trying to project what uh, what the vanadium price is going to look like in the future. And this is just uh, the data, inflated data, looking at it on an annual basis and 
really the point here is just to show that uh, uh, on an inflated basis, the preponderance of the time we've seen prices you know, north of $10. So summarizing this all, um, we're going to see growth in vanadium consumption um, in batteries. Uh, we didn't talk about vanadium and cathodes of lithium ion batteries, but that's also a topic of hot research right now and could be important. But clearly we're going to see more consumption in energy storage. How much more is, is anybody's guess, frankly? Um, in the steel industry, we're going to see growing consumption as the specific consumption rate continues to grow while we project uh, global steel production to start to uh, stabilize and, and show relatively low growth rates. Um, with very modest uh, growth in vanadium and energy storage, uh, this market's going to be challenged to, uh, to meet the demands. And again, uh, this last two bullet points, just looking at uh, long term uh, inflated prices have generally been above $10. And uh, today, the cash cost of those last incremental units required to satiate demand is just about uh, $12. So I'm going to very shamelessly move on here to a few slides on uh, my company, U.S. Vanadium. U.S. Vanadium has a vanadium production facility in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, it's a secondary facility, which means we process vanadium uh, residues, ashes, and waste generated from either the burning or refining of vanadium-bearing oils, and we'll go through a hydrometallurgical process to extract the vanadium from those materials. This sheet uh, gives a bit of a picture on uh, the variety of raw materials that will feed into the plant uh, in Hot Springs. The Hot Springs plant produces extremely high purity V205 and V203. And they do this as a result of some unique technology that was built into this plant by Union Carbide back in 1965. And we do feel like we produce uh, perhaps the highest purity vanadium oxides in the world. Uh, those oxides are either sold into the titanium industry or they're used to produce downstream uh, chemicals, including vanadium halides and vanadium electrolyte. U.S. vanadium has capacity to produce about 4 million liters of uh, vanadium electrolyte a year right now, and we shall continue uh, uh, expanding that as the market requires. So that's the end of the presentation. My contact details are here. I'm happy to talk to anybody uh, at any time about vanadium if, if uh, you have some questions or want to talk. And there's a few questions uh, in the forum here. I'm going to uh, go through these uh, uh, quickly, we've got a question, how much vanadium concentrate do you produce and sell annually? Uh, we produce and, and we report production in units of pounds of V205. Uh, our plan for this year is to produce about 8 million pounds of V205. Plant capacity is about 12 million pounds. And by the end of the year, we should uh, be in a position to operate the plant at close to that level. Uh, uh, I, I think we'll be able to produce uh, something close to 10 to 12 million pounds in 2024. Um, let's just see what other questions in here. Does U.S. Vanadium hedge vanadium or enter into offtake agreements? We don't hedge. There's really no good tools uh, short of the uh, Largo Physical Vanadium, which is a relatively new entity to, to hedge vanadium prices. Um, we do enter into long-term agreements with our customers, in some cases using formulatic prices, in some cases using fixed prices. Uh, so we are in a position to be very flexible from that standpoint. Um, another question, is U.S. government providing any support or incentives to increase production of vanadium? Um, I think uh, the answer to that is no at this point. I'm not aware of any vanadium uh, funding that, that's come through. Uh, and I think, okay, last question, is U.S. Vanadium a public company? U.S. Vanadium is not. U.S. Vanadium is a private entity uh, of a, a group of uh, investors uh, who've been kicking around the vanadium industry for a while. And uh, I'm not sure where we go in the future, but uh, certainly there's an opportunity for U.S. Vanadium to eventually enter the public markets. So with that, I'll sign off. Uh, again, thank you for your attention. And I do hope you'll stay on for the rest of the program. We'll see some 